Good morning, everybody. We're going to start the panel. If you could take your seats, please. Great. So it's my great pleasure uh, to begin this much-awaited conference, <laughs> which is our BAG uh, symposium uh, for the Berkeley Alliance for Global Health. And um, what we're going to do overall for the day is have concurrent panels, which start now. And at 9.45, 9.50, we will have a coffee break. And then we'll have the plenary address um, by Mary Robinson. And then afterwards, we have two additional sets of concurrent panels. This, in this um, building, it's going to be in this hall. And in uh, the Blum Hall, it's right as you enter on, um, in the lobby. So what I'm uh, very happy to introduce uh, Professor Karen Nelson, who's going to be speaking um, with her panel about water and sanitation. Um, and uh, the main issue here is that in many developing countries and, and tropical cities, uh, the water is intermittent as opposed to continuously running, if indeed there is piped water. Um, and this actually causes a number of very interesting engineering and microbiological challenges. Um, and so Dr. Nelson um, has been working with her uh, <coughs> erstwhile crew of doctoral students who will be presenting as well in various countries, and she's going to focus this panel, they are all going to focus on the work in India, <laughs> in the slums in India. And so um, Dr. Nelson will be giving an overview of the methodological approach, and then this, the, the doctoral students will be giving their actual data and experiences working in, on the ground on these issues. And so I'm very happy to present um, and welcome uh, Karen Nelson. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess I don't need to be mic'd. I'm going to, this, this is on, right? So we don't need the personal one. Excellent. OK, so I'm going to um, give you some context and motivation for why we care about this issue. So everyone's probably familiar with the fact that there are these Millennium Development Goals. And one of the targets is to reduce um, the number of people without sustainable access to improved water and sanitation by 50%, starting with this 1990 baseline. I probably can't walk over there. Um, so miraculously, and I say miraculously because this was a huge challenge, we actually, it was just announced last week that we have met the Millennium Development Goal for drinking water in the year 2010. So they just finished processing the data. Um, this was a result of over 1 billion people gaining access to improved water supplies over the last 15 years. 20, sorry, 20 years. Um, but unfortunately, the story is not that simple. First of all, the Millennium Development Goal with respect to sanitation has not been met. But even the drinking water goal is a little more complicated than it might sound. So the way that progress towards meeting this goal has been tracked is that drinking water supplies have been categorized into improved and unimproved categories. And so if you look at the statistics on who has access to what, so these are summary statistics for the whole world, in urban areas and rural areas, and the progress over the last 20 years, you can see that in urban areas, about 80% of the population continues to have access to piped water supplies. And the, when you look at things as a percentage, it kind of masks the progress that has been made. So several hundred million people have actually gained access to ur uh, piped water in urban areas due to population growth, even though the percentage has stayed about the same. So all these new people have still gained access just to keep up with population growth. Then there's this, and in rural areas, you can see far fewer people have access to actual piped water. But that middle blue chunk, that light blue chunk, is other types of improved water, which means a um, protected well or, a, um, or some kind of, of treated water. And then in the brown categories, you can see these are unimproved waters. And surface water, <clears throat> if it's not treated, is considered unimproved. But these statistics kind of mask what might be um, actually going on in these blue categories. <clears throat> so specifically with respect to the pipe water, the, the um, way that these, uh, the access is tracked doesn't take into account the water quality. So there's actually no measurement of whether the water that's being delivered in pipes is actually safe to drink from a microbiological perspective or a chemical perspective. It also doesn't provide information on 
or it's not distinguished whether the tap is actually in the yard or in the household. And you'll hear from us later why that might really matter. And furthermore, it doesn't provide any information on when the water is delivered through those pipes. So one of the things that my research group works on is the transmission of infectious diseases through water. So there are all kinds of pathogens that can be potentially present in water, viruses, bacteria, protozoa, and helminth eggs that may lead to transmission of illness. And the joint monitoring program who monitors progress toward these Millennium Development Goals has done some rapid assessments over the last couple years of looking into how many of the improved water sources are actually supplying water that's microbiologically safe. And you'll find, so they, they did these rapid assessments in five different countries in urban areas and found that in fact, a significant number of these water supplies are not actually safe to drink. So a paper just came out last week looking at where we would be, or trying to predict where we would be on our progress toward the Millennium Development Goals if you take into account the fact that a lot of these water supplies seem to be contaminated, and then if you further extrapolate to the fact to, um, that a lot of these urban water supplies are located in very unsanitary conditions, which you'll also hear more from us about in a minute. So if you look at, um, so the orange line here is if you try to adjust for water quality, and the black line is if you also adjust for sanitary risks, and it's a much bleaker picture. So instead of having met the Millennium Development Goal, which is sort of shown where we would be here, um, you can see, and this is in percentage of the population. So in the worst case um, prediction, only, we, we've only gone from 53% of the population having, not having access to safe water down to 47%, and we would need to follow that steep red dotted line to actually meet the Millennium Development Goal. So to make matters even worse, these last predictions that I just showed you don't account for the intermittency of water. And so the norm throughout the developing world is that water is not supplied continuously. You can't just turn on your tap and have water come out. And so these numbers that you see here, that's the average number of hours that water is supplied in, through piped distribution systems in these different countries. And where we're doing our work as an Indian, you can see that the country average is five hours per day. So, the intermittency of water poses some additional risks and additional um, burdens on households and utilities, and that's what we're gonna talk more about, um, and that's what motivates our project. So we've been studying this issue of intermittent water supply in the city of Hubli Darwad, which is in the state of Karnataka in India, and this is a city where over 80% of the population does have access to piped water supply, but service is extremely intermittent. People receive water for just a few hours every three to seven days. And what's really unique and why we ended up doing our research in this city is because they are one of the first cities in India that is trying out this novel concept of continuous water supply, which they call 24 by seven. So starting in about 2007, funded by a loan from the World Bank, about 10% of the city has been converted to continuous water supply through a public-private partnership. And so there's this natural experiment going on which we've been able to study the households that are continuing to receive their water intermittently as they always have, or they, as they, they typically do, versus the households that have been converted to continuous supply. And I should also mention that there's um, currently no treatment of wastewater in the city, and there are a lot of open sewers, and so when you walk around, there's, it's very visually obvious that there's a lot of contaminated water present uh, as well in the city. So how does the water system in the city work? So there are two uh, reservoirs, surface water reservoirs, that supply water to, the to two different treatment plants, and then from there, the water goes into the pipe distribution system, which includes some storage tanks, and then those little um, triangle things, those are valves that um, get turned on and off to decide wh where the water is gonna go at any particular time. And so here's, some, here's a picture of one of the reservoirs and one of the treatment plants. And so based on our research and also on the monitoring data that the city collects, 
we believe that the water quality coming out of those drinking water treatment plants is actually a very high quality. So this is a really good thing. The city is starting out and doing a good job of providing very high quality, safe water that then goes into the distribution system through pipes and a system of storage reservoirs. The most amazing thing about the whole system is how these valves get turned on and off. There are 40 valve men. It's their full-time job to go around and turn on and off these valves. You can see in the upper left, there's a valve in the middle of an intersection down this hole. And so every valve have its, has its own unique key. So they gave me the pleasure of turning one of these on once. So it's this long key that you stick down in the hole and you open and close the valve. And so there's this amazing intricate system of valve men going around turning these valves on and off, which determines where the water gets delivered and when. So as I said, we've been, we've been taking advantage of this natural experiment to study a bunch of different things about households in these two different types of supply zones. So we've just completed a 4,000 household survey that was done over about 15 months. Um, we've collected thousands and thousands of water samples to assess um, how contaminated the water is. We're doing an engineering risk assessment of the status of the infrastructure, especially the pipes. And then we've been using some ethnographic methods to get more detailed observations of how households cope under these different types of supplies. So the overall research question that we are trying to answer is what are the costs and benefits of switching households from their current intermittent supply to continuous supply? It's an enormous cost to do this. And we want to know if it really makes sense. So we know that there are some disadvantages of this intermittent supply, but how do those compare to the benefits that you get from providing continuous supply? So we're looking at how people, we have to understand how people cope with the intermittent supply, um, a huge driving question is which type of service actually requires more water? And there are a lot of perceptions and a lot of opinions about this, but very few hard data. Um, there are also a lot of perceptions about how much contamination occurs, but very few hard data. And then ultimately, one of the things we really care about is if the water is getting contaminated, does that actually result in illness? And can those illnesses be prevented if the water is supplied continuously? So you're going to hear more about how we're trying to tackle these different pieces of this overall research question. And then ultimately, of course, we want to translate this into useful recommendations for uh, the, specifically the city of Hubli Darwad, where we're working, and any other city in India that is considering this conversion. And this is sort of a hot, really hot topic in India right now. And, and lots of cities are considering switching to continuous water supply but with very poor information about what they're really getting themselves into and whether it really makes sense. And so we're also, and it's a huge, as I said, a huge investment. So we're very interested in trying to think about, are there intermediate steps along the way? Are there things that cities that are currently stuck in this intermittent water supply situation, are there things that they could be doing more quickly with lower investment that will improve the safety and convenience of their water supply without having to go all the way to 24 by 7. So before I turn it over to the rest of our panel, I just want to acknowledge the rest of our research team that's not with us here today. So we have um, Professor Isha Ray and Jack Colford here on campus that are collaborators and advisors on this project, and then a wonderful team of uh, collaborators in India and some additional graduate students and um, specifically want to acknowledge the Blum Center, who's been a key supporter of this research. Okay, so next I'm going to turn it over to Cleo Erskine-Wolf, who's going to talk about a little bit more about what it's like to live under this situation of intermittent water supply for the households in Hubli Darwad. And Cleo is a PhD student in the Energy and Resources Group. All right, thank you for coming, um, and thanks, Cara, for the, the overview. I um, am doing my master's thesis on uh, the kind of how much and why of household water use in Hubli Darwad. So I'm the eth ethnographic household observation portion of the, the research team. And um, I'm interested in ultimately in measuring uh, waste and conservation in these two different regimes. Um, but today I wanted to 
just kind of give you an overview of how people cope with this intermittent supply. Um, and so, as you can imagine, if water comes once every four days, there, you need to have some way to store that water uh, between deliveries. And given that the, the exact time of delivery is highly uncertain, uh, there's kind of this trade-off that people practice between uh, how much water, how much space they want to use um, for water storage, how much they want to invest in tanks to store water, uh, and the cost of running out and, and kind of where you, you go to get water if you do run out. And so in the upper left, you see an underground tank. This is uh, common in, in higher income, higher SES settings, and these are typically uh, you know, 3,000 to 10,000 liters. Um, the, in a kind of middle income, in a situation where people might not have a, a, capa a roof strong enough to support an overhead tank, uh, you might have elevated tanks like you see in the upper right. Uh, in, in lower SES situations, especially where people have livestock, uh, you'll see there's 55-gallon uh, drums in the, in the lower left. And then for household water, uh, kind of ubiquitous across SES, you will have these uh, metal storage containers for drinking water. And uh, the... Um, sorry. So, and in addition, um, once people run out of water, in the, in the lower right you'll see this is a public bore well tank. So there's groundwater is supplied publicly for free throughout Hubli Darwad, but this groundwater is of a, a not very good quality. It's, it's high in salt, people don't like to drink it. Uh, but when they do run out of water, if they don't have sufficient space in their home to store a lot of water, then they will go and collect uh, bore well water and use it for washing or for animals uh, or for other purposes, but typically not for drinking. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, in, in high SES areas like you see in the upper left, uh, people will have roof tanks on the, to store uh, water that is pumped from the underground tank up into the roof tank and then will deliver continuous kind of pressurized supply for washing, for showers. Uh, also, the ways that people collect water is really variable. In some areas, the pressure from the city supply is high enough to get water up into the roof tanks or into the, um, the, those big uh, storage tanks that are kind of next to the house. In other areas, uh, the pressure is very low, uh, so people are relying on, okay, uh, or, People are relying on either uh, filling by hand um, with a hose uh, these containers that they're then carrying to their house and, and dumping into their 55-gallon drums. Uh, or uh, sometimes, again, they can bring the hose all the way into their home and fill up uh, storage containers. And very common in, in low-pressure areas uh, are these pumps, which people hook up to the main line and then suck water out of, out of the distribution line into their storage collection vessels. And uh, Emily and Zach will, or, or no, Emily will have more to say about the water quality implications of that. But as you can imagine, all these pumps do further decrease the, the water pressure uh, in the pipes. Uh, and so what I'm trying to do is kind of group all of these different ways of collecting and storing water into different typologies that you could use to then estimate uh, how much water is used in a household. And so you have these different combinations of if you have a shared tap, um, you could have share it with a lot of people or just a couple people. Or if you have your own tap, um, that might be connected to a roof tank or uh, you might actually be carrying the water into the house. Um, and then in these upper, this type three in these upper income areas, you'll have um, your own tap that is connected to a roof tank, in which case you have by default, essentially 24 by seven supply already uh, because you have all this storage infrastructure. And what's a little bit interesting to note is that the type one and type three uh, are what you see where there's continuous water supply. And this type two, where you have a lot of storage containers inside or a large tank outside is uh, what you see in the intermittent zones. Uh, so just to give you, again, a little bit more of an idea of what this looks like, this is out of the window of the house that we live in when we're doing our um, research. And so you can, again, see this is kind of that type three with the roof tanks and, and um, 
very fancy new houses. Uh, and then in the kind of low SES informal settlements, you'll see this is a, on the left is a shared tap scenario where people have just finished doing all of their washing, probably it has accumulated for several days uh, while they were waiting for the water to come on. Um, or this kind of middle SES with a roof that's not strong enough to support a roof tank, but still having a large storage tank outside. Um, and, but again, well, it's very difficult to kind of separate on a given block, you'll see all these typologies side by side um, and, and everything kind of happening all at once. Uh, and so to conclude, what I'm interested in is kind of how does the shift from intermittent to continuous water service uh, accompanied as it is in Hubli Darwad by metering and tariff increase affect how much water that people are using? Uh, how does consumption vary with socioeconomic status? Uh, again, if you have essentially continuous water supply because of having a large roof tank, is your consumption going to actually go down once you have continuous supply from, from a pipe? And a key question is, does 24 by 7 delivery give more of the very poor access to water to meet basic sanitation and hygiene needs? And, the preliminary analysis of, of my data is showing that a lot of people are using less water than, than they really should be um, to have you know, adequate water for, for washing and for sanitation. And then are there new uses of water that 24 by 7 makes possible, ways that people aren't even using water right now that, that might con contribute to an overall increase uh, in water use. And I'm also interested in kind of why people decide to use water in a particular way. Uh, are they motivated by ideas of, of waste? Uh, why are they motivated to conserve? And then how do perceptions of waste conservation and, and the value placed on different aspects of water um, for washing, for washing buffalo, for drinking, for irrigation, uh, change over time in each of these different schemes? Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Emily who will talk about water and quality. Um, so I am a PhD student in civil engineering, and I've been looking at, um, I've been testing water quality and trying to look at the mechanisms that might cause contamination in an intermittent supply, um, and how does the water quality compare between an intermittent and a continuous supply. So first of all, if you're not too familiar with um, testing water quality, I just wanted to explain a few other things that I will be talking about. So how do we actually measure it? So when I go to Hubli and take samples, what does that mean? Um, so it's really, it's very difficult to test for every possible pathogen that could make people sick. Um, so Professor Nelson mentioned earlier, there's viruses, bacteria, um, helminths, and um, a lot of different things that can make people sick, so we can't test for everything. Um, so we test mostly for um, bacteria, total coliform, and E. coli that indicate that there might be things that can make people sick. Um, so when I present some data, um, that's what I'm presenting on, so indicators that it, um, there might be dangerous pathogens there. Um, and then we also test for some other um, parameters that help us interpret that data. So uh, first of all, why is intermittent water such a problem for water quality. So what is it that goes on in the distribution system that might cause water that starts out at really high quality in the water treatment plant um, to become very low quality by the time it gets to people's houses? So first of all, the pipes are empty for hours or days at a time. So when there's no pressure in the pipes, if there's leaks or breaks or cracks or anything, um, water can, or contamination from the outside can enter into the pipes. Um, and then you have these empty pipes that then fill up very, very quickly. Um, and that high velocity of water can sweep the contamination um, and it can kind of flush out everything that's been accumulating in the pipes for maybe three to five days at a time. Um, will then come out in maybe the first 20 or 30 minutes of the water supply. Um, and then when the water actually is flowing, everyone is collecting water at the same time, right? Because they're only getting water for two or three hours. Um, so like Cleo said, they're just collecting water and storing water. And since everyone is taking water at the same time, the pressure in the distribution system is very low. Um, in the US, the, the um, requirement is that it never gets below um, 20 PSI. And we're pick, uh, with the measurements we've been doing, I haven't really seen it get far above 20 PSI. Um, it's very low and can even cause, uh, become less than zero, so basically less than atmospheric pressure, um, such that contamination might even get sucked into the pipes. And then water and storage containers um, become 
be, can become recontaminated by um, hands and such um, when people dip into containers. So looking at the data, so we spent about um, almost a year collecting samples um, from throughout Hubli and Darwad in continuous and intermittent supply to be able to compare the two. So this is the percentage of samples that fall into risk categories. So the ones at the top mean lower risk, um, and then the ones at the bottom means higher risk. So you can see that there's um, so continuous supply and then intermittent for tap water. Um, so we took water when it was actually flowing from people's taps, and then we took it. We asked them, "What water are you drinking?" Um, and, uh, and took a sample of that. So um, you can see that continuous supply so far um, looks overwhelmingly better quality than intermittent supply. There's a lot of contamination that is going on in intermittent supply. Um, interestingly, though, if you look at the stored water data, um, if you kind of look at the, the spread of um, where the samples fall into, even in continuous supply, people are actually still storing water. Sometimes for, they're drinking water for about a day at a time, may, uh, maybe more than that. And there's still um, higher levels of contamination um, that start out very clean at the tap, but by the time people store it for some time, um, then there's more contamination and potentially even a lower level than some of the intermittent supply tap water started out at. So just to give you a little sense of, well, what's going on. So in intermittent supply, it can, the water quality sometimes is really good and sometimes is really bad. So what we're trying to do is understand what exactly is going on. Here's a picture of a map of that's um, one particular ward in Hubli. It only takes about 10 minutes to walk from one side to the other, just for a sense of scale. And the points that are really are green mean very low risk um, samples, and the points that are really red mean very high risk samples. So you can see what's going on is even in a very small area, there's some places um, where the water is pretty good, and then there's some places where it's at a very high risk. So there might be differences in time and space that are going on, where there's local contamination events happening um, in this space. And so just to get a sense of the fact that water quality, in, especially in intermittent supply, can really change over time. If you take your drinking water at the beginning of supply, it might be very different than if you collect it at the middle and then if you collect it at the end. Um, so you can see the green dots in here. Are, so we did an entire supply cycle, um, which was of five hours in this uh, particular area. And so we took samples um, as we went along just to see the difference. And if you look at the green dots, um, that's a measure of E. coli. And at the beginning, um, it's much higher, and then it kind of <laughs> goes down. So this has a lot of implications for maybe making recommendations about how people can improve water quality that they're actually drinking um, by recommending when it might be better to take um, to, to collect their drinking water and when it might be at lower risk. So now I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk more about some of the contamination that's happening. Hi. So as Emily mentioned, you see a lot of variation under intermittent supply over time and space of the quality of water. So a few of us worked on a project last summer in Hubli to try to look at, well, what, what might be the mechanisms that drinking water is getting contaminated under intermittent supply, and then what might be explaining this variation over time and space? Like, can we find out what the risk factors are, and then or you use the variation in water quality and then try to correlate that with what we think are risk factors and see, see which risk factors really do correlate with the problems we're seeing. So just to start off briefly, an explanation of what is generally thought to be a lot of the risk factors. One of them is contaminant intrusion. And one of the, sort of the dirty little secrets, I think, about drinking water systems is that they all leak, at least a little bit. Even here in the United States, a certain amount of water is lost to leakage, but in a developing country where maybe the infrastructure maintenance is not as good, you can lose a lot more water to leakage. So when you have positive pressure, continuous pressure in, in a system, if there's a leak, clean water is always coming out, which is a problem because you're losing the water, but it's not so much of a risk for contaminant intrusion because this water is always spewing out. But in a system like Hubli's where you have negative pressure for days at a time, sometimes there's zero pressure, then if you have contaminated water surrounding the pipe, you can get, you can get leakage coming into it. So where might this contaminated water come from? Well, 
there's, as you probably saw from some of the pictures, there's probably quite a few different sources of contamination near, near these drinking water pipes. But some of them might be surface water bodies, like a pond, that could be contaminated by open defecation, or it could be contaminated by surface water runoff. You can also have open drains that run along the sides of the streets in front of houses, and gray water is being discharged there, runoff from the street. And then also maybe some people are even discharging raw sewage into the open drains. Then you have underground sewers that could be uh, running nearby to the drinking water pipes. And also, although it's not in the picture, septic systems. May, some houses have their own septic tanks, and they could be passing close to uh, drinking water pipes. So what we tried to do in a few parts of the city was map out where are all these potential contaminant sources, and then also map out a few other risk factors that I'm going to talk about later, and then take kind of intensive water quality sampling of the indicators that Emily was talking about, total coliforms and E. coli, and see if we can find a correlation with some risk factors and the contamination to see, see maybe which factors are most significant. And we're sort of building off a a paper by a researcher named Kala Vairavamurthy that he, him and a group came up with a model to predict where the risk of contaminant intrusion is greatest and we're sort of trying to see how well that model works and see what factors might be added on to that model. So I also want to talk about a couple of the things that, this is sort of the general understanding we had or what I had at least before I went and then talk about a couple of the specific things that I saw in Hubli that were not things I thought about before that seemed like they're clear indicators that contamination could be happening. One of them is the sewers are a risk if they're running normally with open channel flow. Sewers aren't normally supposed to be full. They just run, run by gravity. But sometimes the sewers get plugged. And in a case like this, that we took a picture we took in Hubli, this is raw sewage coming out of a manhole cover, which means this sewer is completely clogged and overflowing. So not only is that a problem that you have the surface water contamination on the street, but you also have that whole underground sewer pipe is full of sewage and pressurized, which makes it much more likely to leach out and possibly get into nearby drinking water pipes. Also, as Cleo and Emily were mentioning, people, people connect pumps up to their connections, and that reduces pressure really significantly and even results in negative pressure. And in some neighborhoods, once a few people, a few neighbors start connecting pumps, well, then the pressure goes down for everybody else, and all of a sudden the entire neighborhood practically has to be pumping if they want to get enough water. Another thing is, or another strategy we saw people using to try to collect more water was to actually collect the water below ground level. So they would have a pit outside their house right alongside the water main. It would maybe about four feet deep, and then they would have a, the water connection going into that pit, this green pipe here you can see. And when the water comes, they'll get down in the pit and fill up bucket after bucket and then use that to store or to fill their storage containers. You might also notice they don't have a valve on that connection because, first of all, they have water for a really short supply cycle, maybe just a few hours. So they're collecting water almost the whole time. So they might think they don't really need a valve. And also, there's not too much incentive to have a valve even if some water does leak because most of these connections are not, are not metered. But what happens maybe if the, the water supply cycle is still going on, but they've filled up all their containers? Well, then water continues to go into the pit, and it fills up the pit like you can see here. And it's a little hard to tell, but the water level in the pit is actually above the level of the green pipe. So now what happens when the water turns off, or maybe their neighbor turns on a pump? Well, then the water pressure is going to go down in the pipe, and all this water that's in the pit, and you can see there's trash in the bottom of the pit, and stuff from the street could have been running in there, all that gets sucked back in to the system, which is called backflow. And then, as Cleo and Emily mentioned, also stored water contamination is a, is a significant risk as well. So we're kind of trying to look at what are all these different mechanisms and then try to compare where we find the mechanisms happening, we see evidence of that happening, with the water quality data we collect, with the hopes of maybe being able to figure out which of these mechanisms are most significant. And then, as Dr. Nelson mentioned, in areas where maybe people Maybe continuous supply is not possible right away. At least people can be in, informed as to what the most significant risks are, and maybe they can mitigate those even while continuing to have intermittent supply. I'll pass it off to Aisha, who's going to talk about some of the public health impacts. Hi, my name is Aisha. 
Um, so I will try and um, tie some of this together into um, what we think may be the health impacts of some of the mechanisms that have been described so far. Um, I'm a PhD student at School of Public Health, by the way. So um, we hypothesize that intermittent water delivery may cause increased levels of diarrheal illness in children and as a consequence, perhaps reduced growth as well. And um, as has been alluded to already by multiple people, this can happen through a variety of pathways. Um, we talked a lot about contamination um, in pipelines where in the lack of fluid pressure, you may have things going on like intrusion and backflow and cross connections that could lead to poor microbiological quality of drinking water in the pipes. And we have also said that um, intermittent delivery by nature forces people to store their drinking water between the two rounds of delivery. And people use all sorts of containers for that purpose. And you can see some of them have wide mouths, some of them have narrow mouths, some of them have lids, some don't. And the most common way of getting water from these storage containers is to actually dip in a cup or a, some, some smaller utensil to get the water out. So all of this sort of builds these pathways for a secondary contamination of the water um, during handling, during storage, during collection, while it's stored in the household, which was also evident from Emily's water quality data. Um, as far as these two contamination pathways go, um, we know, for example, we know from data in the U.S. that short-term inter intermittencies in water supply, like during pipe breakages or pipe repairs, we know that during those times, we actually see increased levels of gastrointestinal illness in consumers of tap water, but we just don't know the magnitude of the health impact in a distribution system that by default operates intermittently. And for the secondary contamination in storage, we again know from different settings that this type of secondary contamination while the water is stored in the home can be a significant health risk, but we just don't know in comparison to everything else that's going on in our intermittently um, operated system how big an impact this will be. Um, also, the fact that the water is supplied once every three to seven days, it just may mean that people may at times run out of water, um, especially during the dry season when the rotation schedule is a bit more erratic. Um, by the time your next round of municipal delivery comes, you may actually run out of drinking water in your home. And in cases like this, people may rely on different sources of water, like they can get water from tanker trucks, or they can get formal water, which are typically not used um, under normal circumstances for drinking, but in a pinch when you run out, they may very well be. Um, and we hypothesize, and I think there is also some, um, we also have some data on boreal water quality at this point, that these alternative water sources may not be of potable quality. They may not be fit for drinking. And finally, um, just, be, um, just the fact that you get water intermittently may just mean that you may not enough water, that you may not have enough, um, have an adequate quantity of water to carry out personal hygiene and cleaning chores in your household. Um, and we know, again, from other settings, that water quantity, in addition to all of the other quality issues that we talked about, can also be a significant factor in determining health impact, water-related health impact. So perhaps you may have gotten a flavor of this already from the talks um, that were before me, but we also think that all of these health impacts and the way they interact may differ depending on your socioeconomic status. So this actually is a picture taken from the same angle I think as the one that Cleo showed because it's from our balcony, <laughs> but taken at different times. So you can see that this is a well-off neighborhood and um, it's relatively clean, um, you know, never mind a few buffalo, and um, you'll see that a lot of the houses will have overhead storage tanks. And um, it's been mentioned that these are connected to the internal plumbing of the household. So these households, they virtually simulate 24-7 supply in their homes. I mean, you turn on the faucet, water comes out. So we may hypothesize that, oh, sorry. Am I not loaded? <laughs> I'll stay here. I'll, I'll... Oh, I see. I'll just stay here then. I'll stop walking. Um, so we hypothesize that if you live in a neighborhood that looks like this, maybe some of the pathways that we mentioned are not so applicable for you. Yes, you know, maybe the water quality issues are still pertinent. Um, the water that comes out of your tap and what you store in your kitchen may still be contaminated, but you are less likely to run out of drinking water and go somewhere looking for what to drink, and you are less likely to have an inadequate amount of water for your personal hygiene and cleaning chores, etc. So one might think that perhaps if you live in a neighborhood that looks like um, the picture on the left, Maybe switching from an intermittent to a continuous water supply, like what's happening in Hubli Darwad, well, maybe you won't reap as much benefit from it as somebody else would who lives in a slum 
and who only just has whatever you know, buckets and what they have in their house to store their water until the next round of delivery comes. So that's one way of looking at it. However, we could also say, just looking at the picture on the right, you can say there's this variety of contamination pathways that have nothing to do with what comes out of your tap. I mean, there's, all, there's open sewers, there's open defecation, there's this pond, obviously of dubious water quality. Garbage collection um, is not as good as you can see. Um, so the environmental conditions are a lot more poor than you would have in a high SCS setting. So, so um, one could hypothesize that there's all of these other dominant pathways for disease transmission that would swamp whatever benefit you would get from changing the delivery, um, the, the, the delivery frequency of your, um, of your top water. So it could really go either way that uh, the health impact re reaped by low versus high income households may differ um, when we switch from intermittent to continuous water delivery. To be able to answer these questions, we implemented a matched cohort study with 4,000 households in Hooghly and Darwat, um, both in intermittent and continuous wards. Um, in all of them, we are doing a longitudinal household survey um, over about a period of 15 months to collect seasonal data, because we think some of these things also may vary with season, um, on diarrhea prevalence, as well as water handling, water storage, hygiene and sanitation uh, status in the household. And um, our survey is actually, it's a combination of different components. We do collect re, um, respondent report information um, on things like whether the household treats water, how often they receive water, do they have a latrine, um, et cetera. But we also supplement this with observations that we make in and around the household to see where is the tap located. If the household says they treat water, do they have treated water in their home at that point? If they say they have a latrine, what is the cleanliness situation of the latrine? And things like that, that would be difficult to assess from just asking the respondent and are just sort of better handled by taking a look ourselves. And then we supplement that with water quality sampling, which led to the data that Emily has presented. We take samples from the top water as well as the stored water in the households to look for, um, to look for um, indicators of microbial contamination. And we have also taken weight measurements on children under the age of six years to see if, um, first of all, if there is any impact in, um, in terms of diarrhea, whether this leads to any impact um, in terms of reduced growth in these children. And um, stay tuned for the data. We just finished our data collection this past month, and we'll be coming up with results hopefully soon. Um, and I'll just be, I guess um, that's all I have. <laughs> and um, I'll just be passing it on to Kara to open up for discussion. So, as <laughs> So as you can see, we're like part way through the data analysis, and so hopefully we've like <clears throat> wet your appetites for coming back to hearing us talk in like a year from now when we actually have all of our <laughs> results. But we know that the water quality is more contaminated in the intermittent supply zone, so it means that the rest of our data analysis is going to be really interesting. Yeah. We have time, uh, I think about two minutes for questions, and then we're going to take a break. Charlotte. Uh, Kara, I'm wondering if you know the ratio of safe yield of the source versus consumer demand? The ratio of yield? The, the, in other words... Supply versus demand? Supply versus demand, Ooh. exactly. So if you know the, the value of the, the, the reservoirs and you know the value of the demand scenario under 24-7? Do you want to try answering sure. that Sure. Well, so they... Um, when you actually just looked at the, the capacity of the water treatment plants, um, there was, it was under capacity. So the, the Indian government stipulates that there should be 135 liters per person per day for a city the size of Hubli Darwad. If you just do the basic math and add up the number of people and that demand and compare it to the size of the treatment plants, um, it was actually not sufficient. Um, until they actually just a few months ago, um, they it doubled the capacity of one of the treatment plants and some of the transmission lines so that now it is. Um, but yeah, it was partly that there just wasn't enough, even if you just, there wasn't enough capacity and then combine that with the estimated 55% non-revenue water um, and water loss to leakage, that there was potentially not enough um, getting to people overall. Well, okay, we can take some more questions if there are. Mm -hmm. This may be outside the scope of your study. We're very tech here today. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I'm curious more about sort of the camera panning back and the and the water sources. Obviously, other people will be will be studying water sources, water scarcity, and those kinds of projections. But what the the water that you're studying that gets delivered intermittently, where does it tend to come from? What's the mix in in general, percentage wise, rainfall um, versus drilling versus yeah. It's all, so it's all surface water in the city. Um, there are two surface water reservoirs, so it's all runoff. And these are actually watersheds that aren't terribly impacted by human development. So it's mostly agricultural activities in the watersheds. So they act, they're very fortunate in, this, um, in these cities that they have fairly good water quality to start with. And that's certainly not the case in a lot of India. Um, as I mentioned, there's no wastewater treatment in these cities. So anyone that's living downstream of these cities is potentially, um, you know, their surface water is being uh, very much affected by the wastewater that's being discharged by these cities. But in the case of these cities, they're actually very fortunate with having good water supply to start with. And it, so uh, your study will be shared with who in terms of decision makers <laughs> and can get to listen. So yeah. yeah, we'll be having we'll be having a number of, of outreach events next year, um, targeting local decision makers, the mayor, um, the um, engineers that make that run the city's water supply, as well as the private um, entity that's going to be running the continuous water supply system. And we're targeting the state water board. Um, decision makers at the national level, um, folks at the World Bank and Asian Development Bank who are providing loans for some of these projects, um, some of the large engineering companies in India who are getting involved in these um, conversion projects, converting cities to continuous water supply. Yes, yeah, sorry, I have a couple questions. So first of all, sort of Uh, for the difference between continuous and intermittent, for the people with continuous supply, um, so you had data about the uh, bacterial contamination in their stored water. If you have continuous supply, why would you need to store water, basically? Is the continuous volume not sufficient, or? Very good question. Anybody want to take that one? I think that um, people are used to storing water. They're used, it's, they've always stored drinking water. They have all this infrastructure, and um, people, some people report switching from um, storing their drinking water, especially once they hear from Emily or Madhu that that is making the water of poorer quality. Uh, but and I did see some people say, no, we always just take the drinking water right from the tap. Um, but you know, like all of us, we're used to using water in a particular way, and and changing that pattern of use uh, takes time and probably intervention. I think part of the other reason is that a lot of um, a lot of the taps are in front of the house. So even if they have continuous supply, people had to pay for the extra pipeline to go to for the tap into their house. And they also might not have drains in their house. So if they want to wash their dishes or their clothes or anything, they use the open drain in front. And so you don't want to have to go outside to the front of your house every time you want a drink of water. So I think, uh, personally, I think that's also part of um, the reason in that that would be one of our potential recommendations for switching to continuous supply in other places is that they think more about that you know, last few meters of each household. Yeah, and sorry, one other quick question. Um, so you said about 10% of the city was getting continuous supply. Um, do you have data about the distribution of um, various uh, economic status? Like, is it only the rich neighborhoods that are getting continuous supply, or how does that break down? Yeah, so that speaks to the match nature of the study. So we actually did have access to a fairly rich data set on um, economic as well as environmental variables that had been collected throughout the city before this thing was put into place. So we just designed the study such that, I mean, first of all, just looking at the data, it seemed like you know, they, they really did um, try to target low as well as high income neighborhoods with this. Um, and we designed our study such that we created a matched cohort of finding intermittent supply um, wards or the administrative units that match the ones that got to continuous supply in as many ways as possible in terms of the key variables. In terms of the socioeconomic status, uh, like do the higher income status people boil the water more so that even though you may have contamination 
and how is that affected? And also, when you have continuous water, how much more is the water sub usage changing, like for sanitation, for toiletry, and things like that? Yeah, I mean, those are just active questions that we're trying to tackle. Um, in terms of treatment, we have collected the data. I haven't analyzed it yet, but um, I mean, one could hypothesize that one socioeconomic stratus, um, stratum treats more than the other. I'm not really sure. I think in terms of like some of the more fancy treatment mechanisms, like filters, yeah, the well-off are more likely to be using them. But I have a sense that voiding is pretty ubiquitous throughout socioeconomic strata. But we'll see. <coughs> the data will tell us. Uh, and in terms of the quantity, um, I'll just pass it on to Yeah, I think that the quantity is also um, an op open question. Although, as I, as I hypothesize, if you have default 24 by 7 uh, supply because you have a, a underground tank and an overhead tank, uh, you might expect that that wouldn't change. The other big uh, driver of, a uh, potential driver of use is how much you're being charged for, for that water. And so under the intermittent supply conditions, uh, there's very few areas where there is volumetric metering. Uh, and most people pay a flat rate for water and many people do not pay for water. Um, so the hypothesis of, of the, the World Bank and the water company that's in, implementing 24 by 7 is that when people are charged the volumetric weight, the rate, they'll use less. Uh, the one finding so far from, from, from my work is that it's incredibly difficult to measure that, and no one has, has gone out and actually measured how much water people are using in intermittent supply. And it's very difficult to separate you know, how much water is being lost along the distribution line, how much water are people actually using when the water's on and, and it's just running for four hours. Uh, estimating how much water people are storing is more easy, but again, they could be supplementing from bore wells or from tanker trucks. So actually piecing that, that story together is, is very challenging, and I'll do the best that I can. <laughs> but and yet, the, but the data are so important because there are people on both sides of this policy question saying that, oh, we save water by delivering it only intermittently versus other people saying like, oh, it actually will save water by converting to continuous supply because then we can use volumetric tariffs to actually control demand. And so it's a supply-driven system versus a demand-driven system, but there are no hard data that allow you to actually figure out what's true. I'm going to, um, because we do actually have coffee, and <laughs> <laughs> I am going to call the coffee break now. Um, <laughs> this has been really fascinating, and it's a little over schedule uh, because of the interest and the same thing going on in the other hall, actually. So we're going to take a, about a five minute break now, and you can rush out and get some coffee, and then around 10 or 5, we'd like to start gathering back for our plenary talk here. Um,